So, everyone, welcome back. I'm your host, Veteran Mountain Man, and yes, I am doing a live recorded video today. Uh, I was just watching Alicia Clegg's video talking about an individual who has done up a scenario about California leaving the Union. Now, while watching this, I noticed some serious assumptions on his doctrine and Alicia was wanting some uh, military and or veterans to respond to this, so I figured I'd go ahead and cut a response video and discuss some of the inaccuracies that were going on. So, uh, let's start with a clip. Information on everyone. Seriously, doesn't seem like a good thing, but that's the way of the world, I suppose. Now, I am not in the military. So, I'm going to ask any of my military friends to feel free to do a response video or uh, give us a really good comment on what, what you think about. I will gladly share your opinion. Also note that I'm going to read his entire answer to the question of who would win a civil war before I even comment on it. Now, I'm unsure when this man first wrote it, but it was updated in 2017. So I will be including the original map he posted in 2012 and then the 2016 map. <coughs> Quote, the dividing lines of today are politics, not allegiance to individual states, and not slavery. So there is no point in adding those to the scenario. And in most of the country, it will look like this. And adjusted for population. Notice that the colors suddenly switch on the map. Anywhere in the... So we just saw the maps that this guy posted. Um... One of them was the congressional districting map based on uh, seats within the United States Congress. And the other is some sort of artistic war shack that he did stating that it's adjusted for population. Well, his whole argument at this point is now based off of a logical fallacy. Because, see, the congressional districts, which is the first map that she showed, are already based on population. That's right. Let that sink in. There is no adjustment for population. That is population. See, the U.S. Constitution requires that voting for representatives be done based off popular statistics from the census. And all citizens have to be counted for... And all aliens need to be counted as best as approximations can be on a one-to-one -one basis. That means that you've got a population map. It might not be completely accurate because it's only done every 10 years. But your statistics are probably not any more accurate, considering you seem to think that there are so many more people that will cause that deflation of the center of the nation in that way. I think perhaps this whole argument is based off of some wishful thinking, because this whole appeal here to uh, false statistics and a redefining of statistics shows a, a central lack of rhetoric. Now, how can you even attempt to justify your position based off of false rhetoric and false statistics? I have no clue. I just know that the U.S. congressional maps for congressional districts and representative voting have to be done based off population. And if you're trying to adjust them based on population, you obviously don't realize that they already are adjusted based on population. And therefore, I don't give any weight to your argument at that point. U.S., where there is a mix of liberals and conservatives, you will see this. Checkpoints. Individual groups would rule certain areas. This is Lebanon, 1976. But just change a few names and it becomes Illinois, 2020. 
There is a name for this. It's called balkanization. Now, he is correct. It is called balkanization when you create seriously divided factions within a government to the point where there are security checkpoints and security forces wandering around dividing the population. Now, the problem is, is in many cases, like in Lebanon, uh, you have to have a severe factor that initiates everything. Usually that's totalitarianism or some other form of authoritarianism. Now, this idea that conservatives are going to cause this is, well, to be fair, it could happen. Uh, it's unlikely, but it could. There are a lot of conservatives out there like me who keep telling these authoritarian conservatives to shut the heck up and sit down. But I have noticed a much larger push from the authoritarian left than from the authoritarian right. Much of the authoritarian right is theocratic in nature and Christian. And Christian theocracies can easily be dissuaded far simpler than the communist sympathizers of the left who seem to think that their ideas are perfect even though they have failed multiple times. What would make this particularly brutal is that in most places in the U.S. the factions are all close together and relatively evenly matched. Now, this assertion shows a fundamental lack of knowledge of the rest of the United States that this Berkeley professor has. Uh, you know, I, I'm glad Alicia brought this article forward because I never would have found it with how much uh, convoluted searching she had to do, simply because I wouldn't have taken the time. Uh, I guess I'm going to have to start taking more time to search some of this stuff out so that I can take it to you and refute it. The truth of the matter is, is that, uh, especially in Oregon, California, and Washington, the communist supporters and the conservative factions are not evenly matched. And when you start looking at places like Texas, Tennessee, Oklahoma, Utah, Wyoming, Montana, where conservatives and even extremist conservatives form militias, and where you've got 10% of the veteran population, of which 6 to 7% are conservative, more like myself, where they just want to be left alone. You come to the point of the left and the conservative or centrist factions are not evenly matched. In fact, if the conservatives could get the centrists to combine behind individuals like myself and some of the other 1776 or uh, anti-theocratic, uh, anti-authoritarian conservatives where we push to have a small, limited government, I don't think that they could stand a chance. Now, this is all assuming that we don't have another situation exactly like what happened in the Civil War where the 55 delegates of California drop out of the Congress and Senate and whichever additional states choose to follow them. And the remaining conservative delegates primarily, which will overwhelmingly go beyond the 50% mark in the Senate and overwhelmingly go beyond the 70% mark in the Congress, vote to reinstate the union to these states which have seceded. So at this point, I mean, realistically, I don't know that we have much more of an argument because this war would not be factioned strictly to political lines as it was supposed. That being said, let's try to get to some of the tactical doctrine instead of ripping this guy's very weakly constructed argument apart. <laughs> the great... <laughs> The great, this greatly weakens conservative attempts to form a national fighting force. They will have trouble keeping control of their own respective backyards. Conservatives have a clear geographic problem. Now, as to who would win, it is pretty straightforward. Here is our geography. This is important. 
the most politically homogeneous areas in the U.S., conservatives are outnumbered around three to one, is also the best protected by mountain ranges. That would be California, Oregon, and Washington, and probably Nevada. Not only is California huge, but it would have access to foreign recruits from Latin America and may be backed by China as well. Conservatives don't have a great reputation in the rest of the world, and in civil war, this is going to matter a lot. So, realistically, this guy has obviously proved at this point that he's way beyond foolish, even if... And I do stress this is a big if the United States Army is not assisting the U.S. federal government in the reconstitution of the Union as they did under the first Civil War. The act of the conservatives to be distressed by mountains is absolutely laughable. Uh, the number of helicopters in personal ownership throughout the more dispersed areas and more conservative areas of the United States would allow for air assault tactical entry over the mountains without care of the mountains. Uh, the use of armored vehicles and improvised vehicles, including large heavy-duty trucks and SUVs, primarily owned by conservatives who aren't afraid to use gasoline, uh, would allow for uh, convoy processes through the passes and through the lesser, uh, lesser terrain areas that are suitable for four-wheel driving and off-roading. You throw in the fact that the U.S.'s Blue Water Navy is primarily stationed out of Southern California and Hawaii, and the fact that the United States has a large number of all-weather troops in Alaska... Uh, and you come into a situation where if the progressive left is trying to create a civil war from the left coast of America, it fails within two, three weeks. Uh, this doesn't include the ability to use ultralight aircraft for recon and, and uh, surveying, and it doesn't include the ability to airdrop through the use of 82nd Airborne, 32nd Airborne, uh, sorry, 37th Airborne, both of which are not on the West Coast, into the region to take major supply depots and communications chains before the initial onslaught occurs. Also, the fact in these regions, the three-to-one outnumbering of conservatives to progressive liberals is completely negated by the fact that conservatives own more advanced tactical firepower have better training and more practice using it. And in many cases, owns multiple advanced tactical weapon systems and are familiar enough to interchange them as they go. So at this point, I've basically just shredded this guy's entire theory. Alicia seems to think it's rather incredulous as well. And while I do get that certain progressives and liberals and even communists believe that this is possible. This basically seems like a repeat of the 1840s and the first American Civil War, but faster. See, the first American Civil War lasted several years, and the South actually stood a chance for quite a while. Uh, California breaking off with California, even California, Oregon, Washington, and maybe Nevada would still stand almost no chance because there would not be enough combat capability of those states. And your veterans and conservatives would stand up against it. Keep in mind, the federal taxation goes to hell, which ends the huge pile of money needed to run our armed forces, which may divide against itself on top of lacking funding. It's not a sure thing for one side or the other to rely on the armed forces. Well, so yes, that would be completely true, except for the fact that the armed forces and the veterans themselves 
have all sworn an oath to the Constitution of the United States to defend it against all enemies, both foreign and domestic. And many of the United States military will trust in that. Now, yes, there is a large amount of tax money that comes out of California, but there's a huge amount of welfare money that goes right back into California, Oregon, and Washington. Washington, it's, oh, sorry, Oregon itself consumes more than $40 million in food stamps a year. Now, that is well beyond the amount of money paid into the food stamps program from the state of Oregon. There are many other states that contribute far more totally than they take out compared to Oregon, Washington, and California. So the idea that the federal government's funding mechanism for funding the military will collapse is once again uh, uh, wishful thinking at best. You then throw in the fact that he's stating uh, that no one can depend on the military. Well, to be fair, I know that if I was still on active service and, in a, and a, uh, a state broke away from the Union, I personally would be far more likely to forgo some pay in order to reestablish the Union while waiting for them to get everything into line. Not to mention, California has never borrowed internationally. The U.S. has. The U.S. is far more likely to be able to garner international credit to fund a civil war than California would be. I don't agree with like anything that this man said, but I, I do think that giving people false hope will um, add fuel to the fire and civil war is ugly and from what I know everybody loses especially the weak and those in need of medical attention not to mention that California has some really severe problems right now especially with homelessness if you don't think that it, when war breaks out you don't think that the homeless are going to go in and really pick at those supplies you haven't studied war and this is why you don't want to listen to a professor that seems to think that geography is a major factor in wars in modern wars I the only way that geography would be a factor is if it became a ground troop war not to mention the fact that if there is a civil war do you think that Mexicans are going to be flooding the border where they might get shot by, unfortunately, Texas, New Mexico, or maybe Arizona, I'm not sure. No, they're going to go right in and flood California, and they will take up all of your supplies. Not to mention that you banking on the fact that you're going to be able to get outside supplies that's not a good war strategy at all. And what I found sad is that he really does want help from China. And I actually agree with you on this, Alicia, pretty much completely. This guy hasn't thought about this at all. He has no tactical doctrine and strategy education. Uh, as a veteran, I'm very much aware that terrain does play a part in warfare. But in this day and age, terrain is far less an issue, especially when it comes to air superiority and ground force logistics capability. California is the only place on the West Coast that actually has any refineries for fuel at all. And the rest of the United States has so many refineries that it's insane. Just the state of Texas has five times the number of refineries that you find on the West Coast. They wouldn't be able to supply their vehicles to defend their mountain passes in an attempt across the desert into Arizona, let alone be able to fuel enough electricity to keep California running. This is a pipe dream at best. 
Well, I want to thank everybody for joining me and Alicia today. Uh, I want to thank Alicia for doing this one, and I'm glad I got a chance to respond to it, even though I had a few technical difficulties today. Please don't forget to check out her YouTube channel down below, as well as my U the rest of my social media channels. I am going to include also her Minds.com channel in the link below, so that you can actually see her feed. And as always, have yourself a great day.